سيد المرسلين وحبيب اله العالمين ابي القاسم محمد. اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد وعلى ال بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المكرمين الغرر الميامين سيما بقيه الباب الارضين. وحجته على الخلائق اجمعين سيدنا وامام زماننا وصاحب نعمتنا وولي امرنا مهدي هذه الامه وطاووس اهل الجنه الحجه ابن الحسن العسكري فراه ارواح العالمين اللهم كن لوليك الحجه ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه For the hastening of his reappearance and for our cries of Al Afu rising along with his cries and for his prayers to be answered with regards to his followers and his lovers, recite another loud salawat ala Muhammad wa My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. It goes without saying that tonight is an incredibly special and auspicious night. According to our traditions, the narrations of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt, tonight is perhaps most likely to be Laylatul Qadr. It's also referred to as Laylatul Juhani, which is in reference to a hadith by the Holy Prophet when a Bedouin comes to him and asks him, which of the three nights is Laylatul Qadr? The Prophet said to him, it's these three. You should hope that one of them is Laylatul Qadr, so strive as much as you can to repent and to seek nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Bedouin said to the Prophet that I can't because I'm a nomad and I'm in the desert. It's difficult for me to observe all three nights. The Prophet said to him then, make sure you observe this one. The 23rd, the eve of the 23rd of the whole month of Ramadan. It's an incredibly special night. According to our traditions, it is the night that not only did the Holy Qur'an descend, but also all of the previous divine revelations, in other words, the Psalms of David, the Old Testament, the Torah, as well as the Injil, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also revealed them on this night. And so the significance and gravity of Laylatul Qadr, we all know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, that it's better than a thousand months. Laylatul Qadr khayrun min alfi shah, which is 
almost 83 years. A thousand months equates to 83 years. So longer than the average human lifespan. <clears throat> Whatever you do tonight will be amplified. If you truly appreciate the value of Laylatul Qadr. Now, why is it important to appreciate its value? Because if we don't, then it won't be worth a thousand months. Imagine you have a gem, but you don't know what this is. It's still raw. It's still a rock. It hasn't been cut or refined. And so, even if it's worth a hundred million dollars, if you don't know the value of this gem, you'll simply use it as a paperweight. And so to you, this gem is worth nothing. It has no value. You could also be someone who truly appreciates the value of the gem. You know it's worth $100 million, which means that you'll take care of it as it, as it should be taken care of. You'll give it its due care and attention because you know how much it's worth. Or you could be someone who knows partially the value of this gem. Maybe you think it's worth a hundred thousand. Maybe you believe that it's worth a million because when your father left it to you, he said that this is worth a lot and a lot in your mind could be a million, five million, ten million. So how much do care and attention you ascribe to something is proportionate to and equivalent to the value of that object to you. I could be someone who appreciates the value of Laylatul Qadr up to 10% or 50% or 70%. However, for Laylatul Qadr to be worth over a thousand months, or the equivalent of the average human lifespan, or more, I have to truly know its value. The fact that the Qur'an was revealed on this night. Tanazzal al-Mala'ikatuhi. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues to send the angels year after year on every day of Al-Qadr, which is why the Imam says, Go and debate with them using none other than this verse in Surah Al-Nazana to prove the existence of a hujjah and a proof and a representative and a vicegerent of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the earth at all times. That's all you need. Tanazzal al-Malaik. Tanazzal denotes continuation. And it means that this happens not just in the lifetime of Rasulullah, but also every subsequent year until the Day of Judgment. Once we begin to appreciate the value of this night and how it factors into, or rather determines our fate, that's when every breath we take, every syllable we utter, every action, that originates from us is aligned with the value of Laylatul Qadr. Which is why for me to talk too much tonight, I think, is a mistake. But our scholars, such as Shaykh Ustadul ibn Badway, he says that one of the recommended deeds on this night is mudarasatul al It is to engage in scholarly discussions, it is to acquire knowledge, it is to increase your ma'rifah. Because again, without ma'rifah, you don't appreciate the value of this night. You have to have knowledge of how to evaluate a gem before you can put a price on it. Otherwise, it's just something that someone tells you and you take their word for it. So, mudarasatul ilm, talabul ilm, is something that our scholars have said and stressed is part of the 
A'mal of Laylatul Qadr. Now, we're told and we've been instructed by the Holy Prophet and his progeny that what you're supposed to do on Laylatul Qadr is Ihya'uha. Ihya means what? It is to keep something alive or revive something that's already dead. It comes and stems from the word Hayat. So one of the things we're supposed to do tonight is to keep the night alive. Most people take that to mean that you're supposed to stay up all night until Fajr's time, which of course is recommended. For me to fall asleep means that I'm going to miss out. I'm missing out on the descent of celestial beings, on God's angels, on the blessings and mercy that this night brings. So don't fall asleep, sure. But is that really all Ihya means? Or is there something more to it? I want to talk a little bit about this, inshallah, in the few minutes that I have at your service, so that we can, once again, try and make the most of this. What does Ihya mean? What does Hayat mean? To live, to truly be alive. What does that mean? How do we become alive? Bodily functions are things we share with every living human on the face of this planet. But is everyone truly alive? Or do we observe people who are dead despite the fact that they are animated? Meaning that they walk and talk and breathe and eat and they travel the land, they trek the road, but are they truly alive? When you look at them, you feel sorry for them. You feel that given how distant they are from divine guidance, they are no more alive than a rock. Some of the things I've seen in this country as we drive down the road, you look at these people and you feel sorry for them. You're like, is this person really alive? Or are they dead but continue to function as though they're alive? Look at what the Quran says. And tonight's topic, brothers and sisters, is the single most important topic that we can discuss. Because as I said, everything we do tonight matters. And we can't waste time. The reason you're not supposed to fall asleep is because you're wasting precious and valuable time. So if I speak about a topic that is secondary, that is peripheral, I'm wasting your time. And so you have every right to grab me by the collar on the day of judgment and say that these minutes and these hours were worth more than 83 years. And you talk to us about this topic and that topic just because it's interesting, just because it's attention grabbing, just for the views and the hits. You wasted our time. You have every right to do that. <laughs> and so the topic that I talk about has to be the single most important and most relevant and most pertinent to us so that we can make the most of tonight. But I say, and do so in the most bold manner, that the topic we will talk about is the single most important. I will present the evidence, then I'll present the topic. Why should I present the evidence? Because brothers and sisters, you should learn to challenge your speech. Unfortunately, there is a tendency for people to listen passively to those who sit on the pulpit without ever challenging them, taking everything they say as the gospel truth. That's a mistake. And I'll be the first to call for you to challenge your speakers. A faqih 
A jurist of the highest caliber is someone we're supposed to obey. We're supposed to follow their lead. Because the Imams have told us to follow the lead of scholars who are righteous and pious and who are jurists. In other words, they've reached the highest level of ishtihad. But a speaker is not someone you should simply take his word as though it is divine revelation. If you hear someone from the blessed pulpit recite poetry of Rumi, be bold enough and brave enough even if you don't want to disrespect the speaker, take him aside after the lecture and say, how dare you recite poetry by a man who says that Abu Talib was khabith? How dare you? If someone sitting on the pulpit says to you and speaks about the virtues of this arif and that mystic, take him aside and say, where is Al-Baqir and Al-Sadiq from this? Instead of teaching us the words of the Ahlul Bayt, as the Imams themselves have instructed us, Why are you reciting this garbage to us? That both wastes our time and confuses the listener. Where are you from the hadith of Imam al-Sadiq who says, Iyaka. Beware of ever putting someone just beneath the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The distance between hujjah Allah and the grandest of scholars is the distance between the earth and the highest position in the celestial realm. All of our scholars, the righteous, good, pious ulama of the Ahlul Bayt are nothing but the dust underneath the feet of Hujjatullah. And you're talking to me about this Arif having extraordinary abilities, being able to go through walls and do this and do that. Please, no offense, talk to me about Al-Baqir was sadiq Talk to me about the Ahlul Bayt And if I praise a alim, if I praise a scholar, then it should be in unison with the Imam and it shows his proximity to the Hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not places him in a position that is parallel to the Imam, as though they're in competition sometimes. Challenge your speakers. Don't be passive listeners. And to be able to challenge your speakers, there's a nuanced point to be made here. You also have to elevate your ma'rifah and your knowledge. You should familiarize yourself with the literature of the Ahlul Bayt and the Holy Quran. You should elevate your rank when it comes to the sciences of Islam so that you can make a bold stance and challenge your speakers once they make a mistake. And of course, we're prone to making errors and mistakes. Some of us inadvertently, by accident, by mistake, we all make mistakes. And some deliberately. And it's those speakers that you must challenge. So, what is the evidence that what I'm about to present to you is the most important topic? It is this. We said, Ihya Laylatul Qadr, right? To keep it alive. How do you keep Laylatul Qadr alive? By being alive yourself. How do you maintain your own life? Look at the Quran. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amin. Istajibu lillahi wa lirrasool idha da'akum lima yuhyikum. Oh you who believe. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not speaking to atheists. He's not speaking to pagans. He's not addressing idolaters. He's speaking to the believers. He says, oh you who believe. Respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the messenger when he invites you to that which gives you life. So this hayat is connected to the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's connected to Rasulullah in his time and to the nafs of Rasulullah and those that he appointed to lead the nation 
toward guidance after. استجيبوا لله وللرسول إذا دعاكم لما يحييكم. Now what does the Prophet say? The Holy Prophet invites us to that which gives us life. How? He says, "Man ma tala yarif wa imam zamanihi ma tamita ta jahiliya." Mita ta jahiliya. Think about this. It doesn't mean that the the death of the one who does not recognize the Imam of his time does not have ma'rifa of the Imam of his time will be a death of jahiliya only. It means his entire life was a life of jahiliya. Not knowing the Imam of my time makes me a person who lived in the time of absolute and utter ignorance. The time when they used to commit infanticide. They would bury their daughters alive. They would eat the most disgusting and repulsive things and thought that that was good nourishing food. They would dip camel hair in blood and eat it as a delicacy. They would commit the most atrocious, most violent, most vicious acts and thought that was bravery. A person who doesn't recognize the Imam of his time says Rasulullah wa hujjatullah. That person will live a life of ignorance and die a death of ignorance. Imam Sadiq elaborates further. He says, Mita ta kufrin wa nifaq. A death of disbelief and hypocrisy. If I don't know the Imam of my time and I don't connect to the Imam of my time. And so this is the most important topic, isn't it? Because it means the difference between a death of ignorance and a life of disbelief and a life that is truly alive makes a big difference. Which is why, my dear brothers and sisters, if we talk about other things, the branches of religion, if we talk about akhlaq tonight, is that not appropriate? If we talk about marital relations, if we talk about the relationship of community members with each other, if we talk about Salatul Arham, if we talk about parenting, if we talk about all these topics that have their roots in our faith and our religion, they're all good topics, they're all relevant topics, they're all very important things that we need to be mindful of. But if we don't connect back to the source of our lives, then it's all a waste of time. If we preach to a dead corpse, if you deliver the most articulate and eloquent lectures about these religious topics, but you're doing it to a dead corpse, have you made a difference? Will the dead corpse benefit from this? So what do you need to do then? You need to start not with the branches, but the very roots of this tree. The root of the tree. The thing that gives us life and hayat, according to the verse that I recited, is to connect to the hujjah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Brothers and sisters, let's not waste our time. What does it actually mean to connect to the hujjah and the imam of my time? I might recite poetry, and that's beautiful. I might read dua al-faraj after the majlis, beautiful. I might put up a banner or cloth on the wall that reminds us of the Imam. These are all good things. But that's not the core of Ma'rifah of the Imam of the time, is it? The core of Ma'rifah, the core has to do with connecting with him in a way where he casts his blessed shadow on my life all the time. It means that the Imam's presence is felt at all times. In every dealing and transaction and relationship, in the morning and in the night, again, this is beyond just reciting dua al-ahd. This is beyond just reciting dua al-nutbah, which are all incredibly important ways of connecting to the Imam. 
But we're talking about the actual connection that happens after you recite all these things. In other words, the objective, the ultimate conclusion. It means that the Imam of my time is a presence that affects my actions. This example I'm sure you've heard before. If they ask you, for instance, do you believe that Jupiter has 12 moons? You might say, well, no, I didn't. But then if I present the evidence to you and tell you that NASA's Voyager's Voyager missions, they sent back in the late 70s and early 80s, they sent information back to NASA headquarters that proved that Jupiter has 12 moons. Now do you believe? You might say, yes. I've seen the evidence. I've seen the facts. I've looked at scientific papers. I believe that Jupiter has 12 moons. My next question to you is, does the existence of 12 moons that circulate and orbit around Jupiter, does it have any impact on your life? And the answer, of course, is no. While I believe incontrovertibly and without a shred of doubt that Jupiter exists, that it has 12 moons, but that belief of mine is not translated into action. It doesn't affect my decision making, it doesn't affect my relationships, it doesn't affect my marriage, it doesn't affect my connection to my parents. It has no bearing on my life whatsoever. It's a belief that is firm and solid, but that which is also irrelevant, makes no difference to me. Whether it has 12 moons, or 5 moons, or no moons at all. The presence of the Imam, does it have a palpable impact on my life or not? For instance, when I'm about to marry someone, do I marry someone who has a connection with the Imam of the time? Do I believe that this spouse is going to help me establish a stronger bond with the Imam of the time? These are questions that almost nobody asks when it comes to making one of the most important and strategic decisions of my life, which is marriage. These are not questions that factor into that equation. Usually it's about, is she beautiful? Is he rich? Does he have a solid career? Does he have a house? Does she have an important family that somehow I can benefit from? Right? These are the questions that we ask. When it comes to starting a business, is this business something that's going to help me in my service to the Imam, in my relationship with the Imam? Or is it going to hinder my relationship with the Imam? Is it going to occupy my life such that I will have no time to even think about the Imam, let alone serve him? This career path that I want to choose. I remember once a sister came to me and she said that I'm studying in a particular field, I won't mention it, because I want to serve the Imam of the time. I said, well, that's good. Alhamdulillah, this intention that you have to serve the Imam is wonderful. The traditions tell us that if you can prepare just one arrow and place it underneath your pillow in preparation for the return of the Imam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will look at this person and say, look at him, he's actually thinking about his Imam. He's trying to do a small bit, even though it's negligible, but he's trying to do something for the Imam of Islam. And maybe, the hadith says, because of that, Allah will grant you tawfiq to see the Imam, to live long enough to meet him, and to serve his cause. So I said to the sister, I said, your intention is well placed. May Allah bless you. But did you ever stop to think, what does the Imam want me to do? Instead of, I want to do this to serve the Imam? What would he want from you? Maybe the Imam wants you to get married as soon as possible. And to raise a good, righteous family. And to have children who would serve the Imam. Maybe that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from you. 
Look at the traditions of the Arabate when it comes to marriage. Look at the ahadith and the instructions of the Imams when it comes to raising a good family. If your career is going to hinder your ability to raise good kids because you have to stay away from them, because you are busy building your own career and whatnot, then it becomes problematic, right? The sad reality is, brothers and sisters, is that the Imam is non-existent, just like the 12 moons of Jupiter. He's non-existent in my life and the life of those like me. Which is why Amir al-Mu'mineen, he addresses Imam al-Hussein and he says to him, Bi'abi wa ummi ya aba ibn khayr al-Imam. May my parents be ransomed for you, O father of the son of the best maid. Who's the best maid? Narjis salamullahi Her son is the hujja of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then the Imam says, May my father, Abu Talib salamullahi be ransomed for who? For the one who's an outcast. Matrood is someone who's thrown out, maybe once or twice. Tarid is the one who's always thrown out. The one who's not welcomed in my house. The Imam of our time, the Abu Ummi, is Tarid, Gharib, Sharid. And again, if you look at my life, where is the Imam? Where is he to be found? In our gatherings, in our weddings, in our interactions, in our business dealings, where's the Imam? And then we wonder why the Hadith says that when the Imam returns, thousands of people in the most religious place in the holy city of Najaf, in Kufa, they will look at him and say, Go back to where you came from. My life is set. I do what I do and I'm happy. I don't need you to come in and disrupt my life. I don't need you to come in and tell me to do this and to do that because I've created a routine for myself. I've laid out the roadmap for my work and my family. I have a particular way of raising my kids. For you to come and give me instructions and breathe down my neck, the Imam is Tawid, brothers and sisters. In our gatherings, when we sit down and talk, what do we talk about? Usually, it's either the economy, or politics, or tensions and infighting within the community, or riba and slander, it's these sorts of things. Where is the Imam in these gatherings? Sayyid Ismail al-Hamiyari, Ridwanullahi ta'ala alayhi, a great poet and someone that the Imams of the Ahlubayt have spoken of in Uyun Akbar al-Ridwa, which is a highly reliable collection of hadith attributed to our eighth <coughs> Imam. Imam al-Ridwa alayhi salam says that I fell asleep. And in my dream, I saw the Holy Prophet standing next to his nafs, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And next to them was Fatima to Zahra, Al-Hasan, al Hussein, and another man. The Prophet looked at me and said, Say your salams to my family. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Fatima, Al-Hasan, al Hussein. Then the Prophet said to me, Say salam to this man. So I said to the Prophet, Who is this man? The Holy Messenger replied, Hada sha'iruna wa madihuna al -himiri. This is the one who praises us and recites poetry for us. as sayyid al-Himari, Then the Prophet said, tell our Shia to memorize his poetry to that extent. What was the one thing? And he has incredible, beautiful poetry about the Al-Bayt salam. In particular, the Imam of his time, Imam al He used to 
sit with other fellow Shia, and they would engage in vain discussions, like I said, the economy, politics, this, that. And then he would say, let's change the subject. Let's talk about the Imam of our time. Let's speak of the merits of Imam Sadiq Then they would switch subjects again, and he would say, let's go back to speaking about the other debate. Because these are the things that will remain for us in the afterlife. All of these discussions are worthless. They make no difference whether good or bad, who became president, who became prime minister, who the opposition is. All these things are a complete waste of time. On the day of judgment, they'll bring these boxes, we'll open them, and they're completely empty. Why are they empty? Where are my deeds? The angels will say, well, you wasted your time. What deeds? He used to say, I would hate to stay too long in a majlis where the remembrance of Al Muhammad doesn't happen, it doesn't occur in those gatherings. The Imam of the time has to be ever present, brothers and sisters. A Sayyid ibn Bawus, who's one of our most preeminent scholars, Allah bless his soul. He has a, a book titled Thamaratul Kashful Mahajjal Thamaratul Muhajjal. I don't know if it's been translated into Urdu, but I imagine it is because it has been translated into other languages. Kashful Mahajjal Thamaratul Muhajjal. The book addresses his son and his daughter, Muhammad and father. In that book, <coughs> He says to his son, you have this peacock in your house, and you love this peacock. I'm sure you've seen peacocks, right? They're so ornate and elaborate and beautiful. The colors are so vivid and striking. You love your peacock, don't you? Now imagine if you lost this peacock, what's going to happen? You're going to go left, right, and center. You're going to knock on doors. You're going to go to your neighbors. You're going to go and search for the peacock across the entire city. Why? Because you love it. You like it, it's yours. And you feel this sense of connection with it. Your Imam, Sayyidina Bawus then says to his son Muhammad, says, your Imam has been in occultation. Have you searched him? Have you even tried to look for him? In Iraq and places where the tyrant regime executed innumerable people. God knows how many people were executed under the Ba'ath regime. In my family alone, dozens and dozens. If you ask any Iraqi, any Shia in Iraq, and they'll tell you the same story. But what's worse than having a son or brother or father executed is not knowing what happened to your family members. These are people who were taken into custody. My great-grandfather was one of them. He was in his 80s when he was arrested from his home after Salat al-Fajr in the holy city of Karbala. Not knowing whether they're still alive or dead is much more daunting and difficult than knowing they were executed. And people who lost family members like this, they have this tendency. Every single day, they look at the door hoping that their son is going to knock and walk right in. They're always waiting for him. Have you noticed they keep their room? They don't touch them. They don't give their room to somebody else because maybe one day he's going to come back. Right? They cry for him. Yaqub cried until he went blind. His son was a lot older. Yusuf would send him messages every once in a while. We have a hadith that he would send him a message confirming that he was still alive. Because he's constantly waiting for his Yusuf to come back. How do we wait for the Yusuf of Fatima this Yusuf was an outcast. He's not some prince in Egypt. 
he's thrown out. Tonight, when I broke my fast, I took the date and I thought to myself, Imam Zaman breaks his fast every day all alone. We gather with brothers and sisters and families, and yet our Imam has to break his fast without anyone with him. Do we even think about the Imam? Do we try to search for him? Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. That we have mu'mineen around the world who are much better than me. And they actually do put in effort. When they recite dua and nudba, they do so with a burning heart. They go out into the desert on hilltops. When they call out the name of the Imam, they truly believe and they've completely internalized the idea that when you pray for the Imam, they know that praying for the Imam brings relief to them. But when they pray for him, they don't care about themselves. It's like they say, I once met a taxi driver. As soon as I sat down, he said, for the safety and the health of the Imam of the time, recite aloud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Recite it for him. I looked at this man and I said, MashaAllah. I said, what makes you establish this connection to the Imam? He said, let me tell you something, Sayyid. I have this old clunker of a car. It's a terrible car. He said, I have this car and it's my means of sustenance. I make my livelihood from this. I have a wife who is good and righteous and religious. I also have a son who's on the path of the Ibn Bayt, alhamdulillah, I have everything I need. Now that's not something you often hear from poor people, taxi driver in some third world country. He said, I have everything I need. I don't need anything else. And so all I do is pray for the Imam of the time. Because he's the one who is tarid and gharib and shareed. Then he said, the other day we went to a shrine. And my wife said to me, ask the Imam for a better car. This car that you drive, look at it, it's so old, it's falling apart. He said, I told her, ask for whatever you want. I will pray for none other than the Imam himself. I'll pray for the Imam and he will look after me. He will give me whatever he thinks is appropriate and good for me. A point that's critical to be mentioned here, brothers and sisters, is that when we say, let us establish a constant connection to the Imam, we don't mean that you should abandon this world. We don't mean that your dunya is going to be in ruins. That's a Sufi outlook on life. We reject that. We don't accept that. We subscribe to the religion of Adil al-Mu'mineen, who says, Work for this dunya as if you're going to live here forever and work for the afterlife as though you're going to die tomorrow. We subscribe to the system of Imam Sadiq who says He's not from us, the one who abandons this world in favor of the afterlife. You have to strike a balance. So when we say establish a connection to the Imam of the time, what we're actually saying is that when the Imam becomes the arbiter and the axis of your life, even your work in this dunya becomes more serious and more meaningful. You give purpose and direction to your actions in this world, to your life in this world. Your life will suddenly turn from black and white to vibrant and lively colors. Having the Imam in your life means that this life will be one of virtue and morality and goodness and happiness as well as the next. Not just in the afterlife, but also in this world. I mentioned this last night. I said, 
There are people who say, since I began praying for the Imam himself, all of my hajat, all of my du'as, I keep them to the side. I pray for the Imam's hajat. Since I've begun doing this, I, the, the, the moment I did that on one of the nights of Qadr, he said, since then my life has been beautiful. Everything I touch turns to gold. When you pray for the Imam, he reciprocates and prays for you. When he prays for you, his prayer is accepted or not accepted. Hujjatullah. And so, we're not saying that you should turn into monks and live in caves. Far from it. We're saying that when you align yourself to the Imam of the time, suddenly everything you do is going to have meaning and value because now you're alive. And everything you do will be done in a manner that is serious and valuable and meaningful. You combine this world with the next. And that is the ultimate life. So, استجيبوا لله والرسول إذا دعاكم لما On a night like this, the only way I can present myself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and truly repent is to also go back to the Imam. Where's the evidence you should say? The evidence is right there in the Quran. As I said, aligning with the Imam of the time means that your relationship with your wife will be better because you know the Imam is watching. You know your list of deeds will be presented to him twice a week. You know that on a night like this, everything will be shown to him. And so what you say to your wife, what you say to your husband, how you raise your kids, all these things will suddenly take a turn for the better because you, you know the Imam is watching. The way we pray in our homes is one way. But imagine if you were praying in the presence of a senior manager. You wouldn't pray the same, would you? Not that you're acting in pomposity and showing off. You're not practicing riyah. You want to make sure that your salah is done in a perfect manner, so you pay closer attention. That's what's happening. And this is a good thing. If I pray in a certain manner when I'm all alone, when I know the Imam is watching me, is my prayer the same? Absolutely not. And so everything begins to fall into place. Even our tawbah and istighfar. You see, previous religious traditions, the way they practiced istighfar, the way they sought forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was through self-flagellation, which means they would beat themselves. They would cut themselves. Right? This is how they did this. And so in the time of the Holy Prophet, some companions did the same thing. For instance, when the Holy Prophet wanted to negotiate with Bani Qurayza, the Jewish tribe, after the conquest of Khaybar, the Holy Prophet wanted to sign a treaty with them. And the treaty was quite clear and had simple terms. Either you become Muslim or you pay the jizya, which means that you are subjects of the Islamic government led by the Holy Messenger of Allah. You pay a tax because obviously khums and zakat don't apply to you, so you have to pay a special tax. And you maintain the peace between your, your community and the Muslims. You don't try to stab them in the back. You don't try to create an alliance with our enemies. You don't act with us in a treasonous manner. You don't try to deviate the Muslims. You live in peace and we will live with you. The Prophet sent one of his companions who used to be Jewish, who converted to Islam, Abu Lubaba. He sent, he sent this man and said, you go and present the terms to the Jews because they're your people. When he went, 
he entered their temple, that's where they had their discussions. He says that as soon as I entered the temple, I was reminded of my previous life as a Jew. And so maybe he panicked or he was being overzealous, I don't know. But when they sat down, the Jews told him, so what's this prophet about? What does he have to tell us? He pointed to his neck, meaning that in the unless you accept the terms, the whole the terms, the prophet will slaughter you. The prophet never told him to go and say that I will slaughter them unless they accept the terms. There are other measures we can take, other steps that come into place. As soon as he walked out, of course they accepted. When he walked out, he felt remorseful. He felt sorry. He shouldn't have done this. He should have delivered the Prophet's message verbatim. What did he do to repent? He went to the masjid and he tied himself to one of the columns in the masjid and said, I will not leave this place until Allah forgives me. Self-flagellation. This is something that was commonly practiced. After everything had ended, the negotiations, the dust had settled, they asked, where is Abu Lubaba? They said to the Holy Prophet that he has tied himself to one of the columns in your masjid and he says, I won't leave until Allah forgives me. فَابْتَسَمَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ The Holy Prophet smiled. He said, لَوْ جَاءَنَا لَاسْتَغْفَرْنَا Had he come to us, we would have asked Allah to forgive him. Why go there and tie yourself to a column? Come to me. وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِظْظَلَمُوا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shows you that seeking forgiveness on a night like this means connecting to the hujjah of Allah. Allah says, وَلَوْ أَنَّهُمْ إِذْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ جَاءُوكَ فَاسْتَغْفَرُوا اللَّهِ When they oppress themselves, meaning they commit sins, if they came to you and sought forgiveness from Allah, وَاسْتَغْفَرُ لَهُمْ الرَّسُولِ لَوَجَدُ اللَّهَ تَوَّابَ الرَّحِيمَ when the Prophet asks your forgiveness, they will surely find that Allah is all forgiving and merciful. They came to their father, the children of Yaqub. Why not just repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Why not just go do Umrah and ask Allah for forgiveness? Why not do a ziyarah? No. They came to their father, to the hujjah of Allah of their time. They said, we want you to seek forgiveness for us. We have been oppressive. We have wronged ourselves. We have committed a grave sin. And he said to them, that I will ask Allah for forgiveness for you. Don't worry. Tawbah means you should connect to the Imam. Your relationships, you have to connect to the Imam. Your actions all have to be aligned with the Imam. And so tonight, we have no other way but to connect with the Imam. He is, after all, our Father. When you connect with Him, you establish a love in your heart that crosses every boundary, that becomes indescribable. Indescribable. Absolute obedience that is coupled with pure pleasure of serving the Imam, serving the Hujjah of Allah. He came to the Hujjah of God in his time, Aba Abdullah Hussain. He said to him, Sayyidi Ya Aba Abdullah, even though they were brothers, Ya Aba Al-Fadl Abbas. He never called him my brother until the very last moment because he knew Imam Hussein loved to hear this word. Akhi Aba Abdullah. But throughout his life, his mother Umm al Banin had taught him to stand with respect in front of their brother Imam al Hussein. He came to him and said, Sayyidi Aba Abdullah, laqad daqa sadri min haulahil qawm. I feel this pressure on my chest. I can't take it anymore. Would you give me permission to go and fight? The Imam said to him, Ya Abu al fadl if you go, my entire army will collapse. Remember, Abu al fadl al-Abbas was the last of the adults to be killed, which means on his own, he was the entire army of Hussein. 
If you go, shamatabi aduwi. If you die, my enemy will rejoice because Hussein has no more a protector. Then the Imam says to him, In kana wala bud, if you must go, fatlub liha ulai al atfal shalbatam min al ma. Ya abal fatl, do you hear Sakina crying? Do you hear the children moaning? If you must go, then go fetch them a drink of water. Abel Fadl Abbas was a lieutenant in the army of Hussein. Abel Fadl Abbas wasn't a foot soldier. Fetching water for the children is something that the most menial and lowest ranking soldier would do. But the Imam of his time is saying, Go get water. He says, Nothing. <laughs> Absolutely, whatever you say. He headed towards the water. The arrows began to shower in his direction. The poet says, He's not afraid of the arrows. Absolutely not. Why? Because his objective is to bring back water for the children of Allah. For that, anything can come in his way. It wouldn't obstruct his path. It wouldn't stop. When you align yourself to the Hujjah of Allah, this happens. He's an elderly man. He's a slave. He comes to Abu Abdullah and Hussein. He says to him, can I go and fight? The Imam said to him, You came to us so that we would keep you in our company, so that you would be with us. Now is not the time for you to do this. We're all going to get killed. They're going to kill me. He said to him, Ya Abu Abdullah, Ana fil rakha alhasu qusa'akum. When you are comfortable, I come and I lick your plates for barakah. And you want me to abandon you in your hour of need? No, Allah. <laughs> he was an ironsmith. He used to fix the swords. And so there was this odor and this smell that he always had. He said, Ya Abu Abdullah, I know I'm not worthy. I know that my skin is black. How could my blood be mixed with your blood? Let me go, Ya Abu Abdullah. I know they're going to kill you. I don't want to know what they do to you. I don't want to see that moment. Let me go and fight for you. <clears throat> when he goes into battle, other companions of Imam al Hussein, they used to introduce themselves. They would say, Wala akhshal hirab, I am bringing my sword, Ashrafi, this, that. They would introduce their tribes, but this man doesn't introduce himself by his name or his parents or his tribe. All he says is, Amir Hussein. I usually say to the younger members of the audience, you should memorize these verses so that when you're in your grave and the angels come and question you, Man Rabbuk, Man Nabiyuk, Man Imamuk, your response should be, Don't worry about who I am, Amir Hussein. My master is Hussein. Surah Fuad al Bashir al Nabir. Ali al Wafadl al Tulwanina. Fahad ta'alamun lahum al Nawir. He went and fought until, until he fell to the ground. As he was breathing his last breath, look at how the Hujjah of Allah repays you for your loyalty and your actions in his service. He's about to die. He knows he's all alone. Suddenly he feels a warmth on his cheek. He opens his eye. He sees the face of Abba Abdullah touching his skin. And he says, Met with me. Look at me, everyone. Who's like me today? Is this not the ultimate victory and happiness? <laughs> this is what happens when you connect to your Imam. Look at the love and how it drives you. Two brothers came to Imam al-Husayn. 
History doesn't even mention their names. All we know is that they were from the tribe of Bani Jab, but not their first names. They came to the Imam, they asked him for permission to go fight. Then they said to the Imam, could we go together as two brothers? The Imam said, yes, may Allah bless you. Then they said, Ya Aba Abdullah. They cried, the Imam said, why are you crying? In the Jannah, you're going to meet my grandfather Rasulullah in only a few moments. They said, Ya Aba Abdullah, we're crying because when we go and die, what's going to happen to your tents, Ya Aba? <laughs> Tonight, the true essence of Laylatul Qadr is Fatima. I think we can get the Imam of our time to take another gaze at us when we mention his mother's name. Amir al-Mu'mineen would sometimes be in the company of his companions. Then suddenly he would burst into tears. He would scream in agony and in pain. One day, Ammar said to him, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, you've told us to stay quiet and to not do something that would violate Taqiyya. Why? Why do you cry like this? Amir al-Mu'mineen said, that I never saw what they did to my beloved father. <laughs> and the old woman, he was in chains when they ambushed the house. There was a chain wrapped around the neck of your mawla, ya shi'at Ali ibn Abi I never saw what they did to her. But when I took her, and I was washing her, she told me to bathe her with her clothes on. Fatima doesn't want Ali to see the marks. As I was washing her, I touched one of her ribs and I noticed that it was broken. I want Fatima to And yet, and yet, on the day of judgment, I mention this for a reason. Because on the day of judgment, when the call is made, Ya Ahl al-Mahshar, ta'ati'u rumusakum, wa qudu asarakum, hatta tajuza abati fatima. Lower your heads, close your eyes, not because of mahramiyya, but because no one has the capacity to see the grandeur of fatima. The parade of Fatima. On that day when Fatima to Sahara heads towards paradise, the hadith says that Fatima will then begin to cry. Does she speak about what they did to her between the wall and the door? No, she does not. Does she mention her unborn fetus and Muqsid ibn Ali? No, she does not. What she does makes everyone cry on the day of judgment. She lifts up a shirt that was filled with blood. She places it on her head. She says, I, want, I wish to see my son Hussein. She cries and pleads. Then she is directed to look in a direction. As soon as she looks, she sees a mirage. It's not very clear, but one thing is clear, that person has no head. Fatima screams, Bunaya Hussein! My son The Mahouk! Did they slaughter you? Women should be my Mahouk! They prevented you from drinking water!